Hi everyone, myself Dr. Elias and welcome to Sully's Rounds. In this video, I am going to discuss about management of atrial fibrillation through 3R approach. When you see an irregularly irregular rhythm with a narrow QRS complex, AFib is the first DD you have to think about. Other arrhythmias with the irregularly irregular rhythm and narrow QRS complexes are multifocal atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter with varying block, focal atrial tachycardia with varying block. Coming to the ECG findings in atrial fibrillation, the most important findings are one is absent P wave, second is irregularly irregular QRS complexes and it is narrow and there is a ventricular rate of 110 to 170 per minute. But there are exceptions. Atrial fibrillation can be regular when it is associated with a complete heart block. And it can be slow, that is, the rate less than 60, when it, uh, when it is associated with hypothermia, AV blocking drugs like beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and digoxin, and also with a complete heart block. And QRS complex can be wide, when it is associated with the bundle branch block and axillary pathway. Coming to management aspects of atrial fibrillation, as we know, in any arrhythmias, if it is associated with the hemodynamic instability, we have to cardiovert using DC shock. What are the problems associated with the atrial fibrillation? When atrial fibrillate, it leads to ineffective atrial contraction that lead to stasis of blood in atrium. It result in thrombus formation in atrium and result in embolic stroke. And the second problem is symptomatic tachycardia results from atrial fibrillation. And coming to 3R approach of atrial fibrillation, the first R is rate control strategy and second is rhythm control strategy and third is assessment of risk of stroke. Let us see some definition that is related to atrial fibrillation. Acute atrial fibrillation means a duration less than 48 hours, that is less than 2 days. And paroxysmal atrial fibrillation means duration less than 7 days. And persistent atrial fibrillation means the duration more than 7 days. And there is a term called long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, that means the duration is more than 1 year. As we are no longer considering rhythm control strategy, as we have tried once and failed, or it is contraindicated, this is called permanent, where we accept the fact that patient is in atrial fibrillation and you have to live with this rhythm. This is called the permanent AF, where we usually use rate control strategy. So coming to the first R, that is rate control strategy. It is a first line treatment of atrial fibrillation, except in some cases. So what are these exceptions? It can be remembered using mnemonic new arch. New means when atrial fibrillation is new onset, that means less than 48 hours, or it is atrial flutter, or there is a reversible cause for atrial fibrillation, or clinical judgment where right control is not possible, or in case of heart failure secondary to atrial fibrillation, we can use right control. So these are the exception. Coming to drugs that is used for rate control, the options are beta blocker except sotalol and non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like diltiazem and verapamil. And if patient lifestyle is sedentary, we can use digoxin. If patient's rate is not controlled with any of the above drugs, we can combine. And the target of rate control is heart rate less than 110 per minute. And in case of coronary heart rate disease, the target is less than 80 beat per minute. Coming to second R, that is assessment of risk of stroke. As we know, 1 in 3 strokes after age 60 are caused by atrial fibrillation. So in every patient with atrial fibrillation, we have to look this chart was score. That means C means congestive heart failure, H means hypertension, A means age more than or equal to 75, D means diabetes, S means stroke, and V means vascular disease, 
and second day that means age 65 to 74 and the last S is female sex category. If patients get a score of 3 out of 9 in female or 2 out of 9 in male, we have to consider anticoagulation. If patients get a score of 2 out of 9 in female or 1 out of 9 in male, a decision regarding whether aspirin or anticoagulation is actually based on clinician judgment and it is individualized. In every case that is before anticoagulation, we have to consider bleeding risk. Earlier, this bleeding risk is assessed by as blood score. But according to a new NICE guideline that is published in 2021, they suggest this orbit score. Orbit score means O means older individual that is more than 75 years and R means reduced hemoglobin and B means bleeding history and I means insufficient renal function that is GFR less than 60 and T means treatment with antiplatelet agent. So, if the patients get a score of 0 to 2 that means is low risk patient and if the score is 4 or more that means is high risk for bleeding. So, always weigh risk versus benefit before starting anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation. The risk, risk for stroke is assessed by chart VASC and risk of bleeding is assessed by orbit score. Who all are the candidates for anticoagulation? So, any patient with valvular atrial fibrillation, non valvular atrial fibrillation with the satisfied chart VASC score, atrial fibrillation lasting more than 48 hours, and atrial fibrillation associated with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In all these cases, we have to start anticoagulation. Coming to choice of anticoagulant, all guidelines favor the use of DOAC, that is direct oral anticoagulant drug or NOAC, that is novel drugs. We can remember this drug by a mnemonic called DIR, that means dabigatran, idoxaban, apixaban, and rivaroxaban. In all cases, we can use these newer drugs except in valvular atrial fibrillation, where we have to use vitamin K antagonists like warfarin or acicomarin. So what is meant by this valvular atrial fibrillation? It means patients with mechanical heart valve or rheumatic mitral stenosis or moderate to severe non-rheumatic mitral stenosis. All these are collectively called as valvular atrial fibrillation where we have to use vitamin K antagonist. If anticoagulation is contraindicated, we can treat the patient with the left atrial appendage occlusion, that means LAAO. Coming to rhythm control strategy, that is the last R in this 3 R approach, when rate control strategy is failed or patients still have symptoms even with the rate control strategy or new arch that is already described in last slide. In all these cases, we prefer rhythm control strategy. For rhythm control, there are two methods. One is cardioversion and second is ablation. In cardioversion, there are two approaches. One is electrical cardioversion and second is pharmacological cardioversion. The first line treatment is actually synchronized DC cardioversion. And we have to start with 200 joule and we can increase this up to 360 joule. And coming to new onset atrial fibrillation, that means less than 48 hour duration, where the clotting risk is actually very low. And we can immediately cardiovert without anticoagulation in this patient. If the atrial fibrillation sustained more than 48 hours or unknown onset, before DC cardioversion, we have to anticoagulate at least 3 weeks or we have to rule out left atrial clot by transesophageal echo. If transesophageal echo is not available, we can use cardiac CT. After excluding LA clot, we can DC cardiovert the patient and we have to continue this anticoagulation for at least 3 weeks. It is because atrium is still not contracting because of stunning. And after 3 weeks, we can assess 
stroke risk by chart VASC. And we can continue anticoagulation based upon chart VASC score. And this may or may not be followed by amiodarone maintenance for 12 months based on clinical judgment. Coming to ablation, that means if medical management failed or medical management is contraindicated, we can ablate either left atrium or AV node. If you use AV nodal ablation, patient should be put upon permanent pacemaker. Again, coming to the management of acute atrial fibrillation, that means less than 48 hours, rhythm strategy is the first line option. And if patient is hemodynamically unstable, DC shock is the preferred option. And if the patient is stable, we can use flicalinate, ibutalite, vernacolant or amiodarone. Amiodarone is preferred in structurally abnormal heart. That means anything more than mild left ventricular hypertrophy, it means it is structurally abnormal. In these cases, we can use amiodarone. Coming to the last slide, that is new approach in paroxysmal AF, that is pin in the pocket approach. It is mainly used for this paroxysmal AF if patient satisfying inclusion criteria. That means the resting heart rate more than 70, systolic blood pressure more than 100, infrequent episode of atrial fibrillation, and there is no history of ischemic heart disease or left ventricular dysfunction, and patient is competent. Here, we are using combination of either flicanide plus beta blocker or propafenone plus beta blocker. Patient should take beta blocker first, and after 30 minutes, you have to take 100 milligram flicanide or 300 milligram propafenone. The purpose of beta blocker is to prevent atrial flutter. And in summary, the first line option is right control for every patient with atrial fibrillation. Drugs for right control are beta blocker, non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like verapamil and diltiazem, and digoxin in sedentary patients. Exceptions are new arch and failed right control strategy. Always compare stroke risk versus bleeding risk using chart was score and orbital sc orbit score. And in rhythm control strategy, the first line option is DC cardioversion followed by pharmacological cardioversion. And if patient's medical management is failed or contraindicated, the last option is ablation. So thank you for watching this video. If you like this video, please subscribe the channel.